welcome to another episode of Anime Cons TV, where your source for anime and fan convention news, cosplay tips, general discussion, and of course, convention reports. My name is Doug Wilder, and I just got back from Otakon 2018. It was the convention's second year being held in Washington, D.C. at the Walter uh, Washington Convention Center there. And just starting with the location, I think it definitely it's starting to feel better. It's starting to feel more like home after so much time in Baltimore. It felt like people, just attendees in general, and I guess even staff, knew their way around the area a lot more. Just as you walked the halls, people were moving a lot more efficiently. People weren't didn't seem as lost as they used to be. Things were moving pretty quickly, more efficiently. Um, and I know there was a big jump in their attendance numbers that they reported this year, so even with the increased numbers, the convention di center didn't feel as cramped as last year, I think that's a pretty good sign. It also has the uh, Marriott Mar uh, Marquis, which is attached to the convention center. It's kind of the main convention hotel, although there's other ones in the areas as well. And that's a pretty great space. Um, you saw a lot of people that were using kind of the atrium in the center of it, setting up for photo shoots, a really nice area to that. And nobody ever really felt like they were in the way doing a photo shoot. Like sometimes people would stand on some of the stairs in the area, but no one really blocked traffic, so to speak. Um, and the Marriott, the only thing I would say about the Marriott Marquis is it felt like there wasn't really any programming going on there. Um, maybe that's, you know, room to grow and stuff, but I feel like last year there were some events in the uh, Marriott Marquis, so I don't know why the convention really didn't use that space this year. It's kind of a shame because you could get more programming going on. So I'm going to now go through a lot of the things I did, just kind of all over. I'll try and keep it pretty much in chronological order, but I may jump around here and there as I think of other things to mention. Uh, pretty much the first thing I did for activities at the convention this year was I went in to get an autograph by two of the, uh, autographs from two of the guests that I was really looking forward to see. Uh, Shoji Kawamori, who's probably best known for helping to create the uh, um, anime franchise uh, for Macross, things like that. And uh, Kanatake Ibikawa, who's kind of an up-and-coming uh, mechanical designer. He's done stuff on some recent Gundam series and things like that. And they were the autographs were kind of messy. Thankfully, I got in line probably an hour before things started, so I had pretty much no problem. But the queue was weird, and I, I, luckily I locked out. So basically, they had kind of one area where everyone for that was doing autographs, all the guests were all in this one area, and you kind of hopped into your line. You said you, you went to, and you said, "Oh, I'm here for so and so." You went to that line, things like that. But if you had that area here, over here, there's a giant line to get into those lines, and that was for everybody. So, if you were in line for, say, you were in line for guest A, cool, you're going to be ready. When you get to your chance, you know, boom, you go in the guest A's line as long as they're still open and taking autographs. But if, say, you're in line for guest A and 30 people in front of you are in line for guest B and C, you had to wait for those 30 people to clear out first. And if those uh, guests were more popular than your guests or anything like that, you'd be waiting an extra long time. Apparently they fixed this after kind of it was a disaster, understandable, on... Friday and made it better on Saturday, but it was still pretty messy. Um, I kind of got away with it because I did my first autograph for uh, Shoji Kawamori, and then since I was already in the air, I just moved right to Kanatake Abakawa's line and had no problem, but other people weren't so lucky. So I know autographs is one of those things that no convention ever seems to have a good system, but waiting in line to get into another line always seems like a bad idea, especially when the people in front of you might not be in line for the same thing that you are. So, yeah, it was it was messy, it was difficult. Like I said, I, I thankfully got the autograph and it worked out okay, but it definitely needed some improvement. So, and even the person that was kind of at the front of the general corral before they sent the people to the other lines, the person managing that line didn't know half the guests' names, like, or how to pronounce them because they were Japanese. And... 
they said, oh, I need you to tell me your guest number one, guest number two, and stuff. And the only way to find that was look at the paper guide. So if you didn't have that paper guide on you, like you were using the guidebook app on your phone or anything like that, you had to find someone else that was going to willing to loan you the paper schedule to get an idea. So it was kind of disorganized. If you're going to have someone doing that, one, have them know the names of all the guests and how to pronounce them. Two, make sure they know that if they're going to have guests one, two, three, or four, have them know who the, uh, who the, where those guests are assigned. But again, it sounded like they got it fixed and improved on for Saturday after Friday was bad, but it still didn't seem like an ideal situation. Um, the first panel I went to um, was 20 Years of the Anime News Network, which was held by Zach, who's one of the uh, head uh, people over at the uh, website there, and Mike Tool, who I apparently stalked this convention because it seemed like every other panel if i wasn't watching him present he was in the same audience as me but they get some really good things i like that they talked about kind of how how the site has changed and evolved and stuff but there's a lot of things that they've kind of kept the same like the recommendations section kind of the previews things like that the other thing i noticed zach did that i really liked was he gave really good actionable advice on writing like one of the th first things that he really emphasized was if you're doing writing for like uh source you know like a website or something like that don't do it for free <laughs> if you're doing things like that you know have you shouldn't just kind of give away your talents and just keep practicing look at things find find special areas that you may not have there might not have a lot of articles about it things like that kind of find unique and he was you know positive encouragement but not kind of sugarcoating either it's like yeah it's going to take work things like that uh and it was just really well put together it was and it didn't feel like it was too short too long overall they kept the content interesting and things like that and again asked got some really good questions from the audience and this was a theme i'm going to say a lot of people i noticed that a lot of the panels i went to this year audience questions almost all of them were really good <laughs> well done ones which i don't know why this uh, convention stood out but it just worked out really well um, so I also went to panels for uh, Shoji Kawamori and Kanetake Ebikawa, um, but we'll start off with kind of the, the bad and go to the good. So the bad part was all it said for these panels that these guests were running was in the program guide and it, even in the guidebook app was just the guest name. No real description or anything like that, so you had no idea what sort of stuff you were looking for, expecting, things like that. And I looked out both panels that I went to, uh, one for Shoji Kelmore and one for uh, Kanatake Ebikawa, were about mechanical design and stuff like that. So they were really interesting ones. The first one uh, for Shoji Kawamori was him just talking about what he thinks about for the thought process when creating a design, things like that, like what's what worlds are we living in, what's the technology level, things like that. A lot of more finer details and things to think about kind of the bigger picture. Um, he'd mentioned that he still uses Legos to build prototypes and play with it and see if it can still transform and things like that. And one of the neatest things, unfortunately, I was a little further back, so I couldn't get a good photo, but we had a couple really nice ones sent to us, so we'll toss them up here. He still, he brought one of his Lego prototypes for the new show that he's working on and showed everyone how it was transforming and stuff like that, which was really neat. Um, and Kanatake Ibikawa's panel also, he came from it from a different angle, more just kind of talked about the process and how he talked about how mechanical design for an anime series isn't just, you know, big machines like cars or giant robots or things. It could be anything from a keychain that someone, a character has on their keys, little things like that. And, you know, all these little details and stuff like that. One thing that stood out to me here was both uh, guests gave clearly were having a good time doing their panels. Shoji Kawamori's was much more planned, but he got up and talked about it. At one point, he was talking about how he designed the Gearwalk mode for the uh, robots from the Macross series, and he got the idea while well, skiing. So he's standing up out of his chair and squatting like he's skiing. He's like, that's where I got the idea, and showing us all that, and just very animated. Meanwhile, uh, Kanatake Ibukawa was just really engaging with the fans like i was watching him because i didn't play for this panel i was pretty much the front row 
and I'm seeing him listen to the questions that are coming from the fans, and he's smiling and really enjoy it. Like, he talked about how he still plays video games and things like that, and people were, like, asking him, oh, well, what video games are you playing? And he was saying things like, oh, I'm playing Fall I've been playing a lot of Fallout 4, but Fallout 3 is my favorite, and really having a fun time with the fans, even with the differences in languages. So they were both really great guests. Um, really cool to hear their thoughts and things like that. And, again, uh, Ebikawa's panel was a little bit more of, he was fed some questions by kind of a moderator, and then opened it up to General Skidmore, so it wasn't as detailed as Kyle Morris, but both of them gave really good insight to what they were doing. Uh, then on, so that was all a Friday, and I did, you know, saw a lot more things that we'll get into later. On Saturday, I was invited to join a panel at 9 a.m. called uh, Mecha Fight Club, which was a general discussion, like a kind of what we think of the old definition of a panel, where it's a panel discussion, you know, one moderator and three people all talking about the same topic and sharing their thoughts and things like that. And I was invited to be on it, which was a lot of fun. There were some really good questions, such as, you know, what classic mecha series would we like to see licensed and brought over to America, or maybe licensed rescued. I got very animated talking about uh, the show Die Roker 15. Another question that was asked was, does the series Neon Genesis Evangelion still have relevance in 2018? And things like that. So it was just really good discussion. And as much as I like kind of presenting a, a panel that is, you know, I've researched this and I'm just going to spit out to the audience, I think there is a good place for kind of roundtable discussion panels at anime conventions. It's just a matter of planning them out a little more and, you know, getting good people on that. So that's one area that was good. And I was thankfully very glad to be on it. And just a guess for it, not really running it. Uh, then I went to Mike Tool's uh, bootleg hearing animation panel, which he talked about kind of designs that were stolen uh, from by Korean animators working on anime to make their own animation stuff, and how a lot of these designs were just stolen right from the anime that they were working on, and things like that, and how it's very different. And it's a funny panel, but it's also really informative, really neat stuff, st things that you haven't seen before. And this is a content that I've really come to dig is finding really specific niches in things and doing a deeper dive in it. There's been a lot of good panels like that lately. Um, and I hope that trend continues. One of the other things that uh, Mike Tool did that I thought was really cool was while people were getting seated before the panel started and everything like that, as soon as he was set up in the room, he had kind of a preload screen, which was just playing some music and just had some animation going with a sign that said, uh, panel starts promptly at 11 a.m. or whenever the panel began. And first off, kudos for emphasizing an on-time start because that's one thing that can really derail uh, uh, programming at a convention, so things like that, and just making sure people are ready. The other thing that is it gave you something to kind of look at and just drift off and make sure you're paying attention so you're ready when the panel starts it's not waiting for the panelists to say okay now we go and start up it's something to look at um apparently a couple other people have started doing this as well uh their panels this is the first time i've seen it and honestly as a someone who does a lot of panels at conventions this is now probably an idea i'm going to try and start doing so i'm glad i got to see that one of the next things i did um i actually joined the Gundam photo shoot, as many of you know, I'm a big fan of uh, giant robots, heroes, and Gundam and things like that. But this was my first time doing at a convention, and I've been going to conventions since 2001. This was the first time I went to a photo shoot kind of by myself, just joined a general photo shoot that was uh, promoted. I wasn't going with any friends I knew or something. This was my first time going solo. And it was a really good time. I, I'll get that out of the way right now. I had a lot of fun. Uh, there weren't a lot of other people. I think there's maybe about 10 of us total that came by. And I think part of that is because um, the theme of this year's Otakon was Mecha. Other stuff, there wasn't, uh, there was other programming going on. Like, I think there was, it was scheduled against either the Sunrise Animation or the uh, Right Stuff um, panels, which are, you know, big things and that's where a lot of discussion on Gundam's going on so 
it was a kind of a poor time choice on that. Someone may, may not have been thinking when they were doing the schedule or may not have known, but could have done a little bit re more research. Um, and it was also in a really weird location. It was just kind of an alcove in one of the uh, hallways at the convention center where it was just that. And the only real, real reason you knew you were in the right space other than checking the map was there just a staff member sitting on a chair there uh, directing people and pointing people to uh, the moderator of the photo shoot out once everyone got there and making sure the people kept moving and it struck me as just really kind of awkward yeah you're getting a lot of people passing by to see it but on the other hand it's just in the middle of the hallway i think you could have done more like i mentioned before the Marriott marquee didn't have some a lot of rooms really being used and maybe they could have taken one of those spaces set up a nice kind of neutral backdrop and gotten the photo shoot up and running there. So, I, again, it was just a weird location and I won't say it, it worked, but it could have been a lot better. I also want to give a kind of a recognition to everyone that was in that photo shoot because everyone was super friendly, very relaxed. Because we were a small group, everyone got to talk and enjoy each other's company. Um, and the moderator who was running it, was she was awesome really well done kept things going there so that was really nice to see too so a little weird but still very fun um in the evening i went to the gatai uh, panel called gatai which was all about uh giant robot uh series from the 1980s and recommending various ones to check out there and that was very good obviously i have friends that run that panel but they did good content. They talked about it. They said, you know, why is this series good? Why you should check it out? I mean, it was also one of the few non-18 plus panels kind of later in the evening. I think it was around 10 o'clock at night. So there wasn't as much competition for things. But it was just a little weird that there wasn't more options for non-18 plus uh, panels at that time. One of the coolest things was one of the uh, recommendations was the movie uh, Macross Do You Remember Love, which is a b big important one. And they started playing a clip where they are playing the title song, Do You Remember Love? And it's playing in the song, and all of a sudden the panel starts kind of just humming along. And then you look around, and I actually got video of this. You can see everyone in the room is starting to sing along which was really cool to see, and it was one of those just neat moments that just kind of happened there. And then I kind of called it a night. So on Sunday, I went to, I started with my panel at 9 o'clock in the morning, which I did a panel called How Gundam to Be Became an Art Form, which was a lot of fun. Um, but the only reason I'm really bringing up my panel is I had two uh, f uh, fellow panelists on it, or three rather, but two of them were uh, John and Lauren from Gunpla 101, as guests and they they were happy to join me and i'm glad they had it but again this was some poor scheduling and i don't know if it's just someone wasn't paying attention or what um but they had a super late night panel that they were running i want to say that either started or ended at midnight i forget which either way it's you know pretty late at night and then they were scheduled to be on a panel first thing in the morning too and that's kind of not fair to them as panelists it's kind of exhausting you don't get much time to rest things like that and apparently they weren't the only ones that had that happen to them so i don't know pe why people weren't paying attention but you know this is something that our programming staff should keep an extra eye on is just making sure your panels have a lot of break and even though it's a new day and there's a chance to sleep between going back to back is a, a pretty trying but uh, again this was still there's a lot of good programming out there but that little issue was weird. The last panel I went to was the uh, Disco Tech Media panel. And of course, this is a panel for an uh, anime licensing company and distribution company that I really like. So, of course, I'm going to look forward to seeing all the stuff that they put out because it's things I enjoy. But one of the things that I really enjoy about this uh, Disco Tech's panels is they get more into the details about what the process is to release things some of the weird hurdles they face and how you know some of the challenges and kind of pull back the curtain a little more just showing things like that the last year at otokan they announced that they were releasing the uh, 2000s 
uh, Cyborg 009 uh, series. Um, but this year they're like, yeah, we're still working on it, but it's a longer process. And they talked about all the tapes, like tons and tons of tapes being sent to them that they had to work with and getting kind of all of the, all the media together there. Um, they announced that they're working on a new release of the series, Bo 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 Bo. I, I think that's the right number of bows. Um, and how many subtitle tracks that they had to work with. And they showed us a picture of the spreadsheet that they are working on all the different tracks, like making sure they're te double checking and stuff like that. And really getting into some of the neat, more process stuff of that. I mentioned a couple years ago, they were working on the release for the Lupin the Third movie, uh, Castle of Cagliostro, and they talked about all the process that went into the packaging design and things like that. So they keep doing neat things like this, and it's not just kind of a sales pitch, here's what we're releasing, here's what we've just announced, things like that, go, you know, look forward to it. It's more of the process, which makes it really super interesting. And they have a good sense of humor about it, too. I mean, of course, they also announced 12 new licenses, which is awesome. But it's more than that, too. It's other engaging details which keep it interesting. And I think that's why a lot of people enjoy going to this panel besides instead of just kind of waiting for their, someone else to share the news of what they have to license now. So some other uh, interesting thoughts that I'll share. The dealer's room was pretty good this year. Um, one booth, uh, a couple booths that I'll mention stood out to me. There's one that I've seen at a couple conventions now called Otaku Joe's. And this is like, if you like stuff that's, you know, from the 80s or 90s uh, for anime series, it's gonna, you need to check it out. Cause they have a lot of older stuff like old vinyl records from like, of soundtracks and things like that. Or laser discs, <laughs> yes, laser discs of anime releases. And this has, some of these have, you know, even if you don't collect, you know, don't have a way to play uh, vinyl records or a laser disc player, these are still really good pieces of art. They have some really good designs. One of my friends got um, uh, the laser disc set for the series, uh, the movies for the series Ideon, and it's just a gorgeous looking set. And it's, you know, neat little collectible. Price wasn't too too bad. And there's a lot of neat stuff to check out. So it's a booth I want to, I know eventually I'm going to cave and probably spend some money on some really random stuff for, that means something to only me and a few other people, but they were really cool to check out. I hope I get to see them at more conventions. Um, overall, I noticed there weren't many vendors that had manga this year. Actually, I should say it was pointed out to me by our friend Zan, who runs the uh, Spyroken manga review website he pointed out to me and then I took another look I was like yeah there there's not a lot here I mean I found a couple of vendors but not much so I don't know why manga wasn't that popular this year at Otakon and which is unusual because there's a lot of good manga coming out right now a lot of neat stuff so maybe we'll see more come down the road but they're not this year the other thing that's really weird was um Crunchyroll, which is, you know, the big streaming service for anime, didn't have a booth this at Otakon this year. Like, I looked around, I double-checked, and yeah, they did not have a booth. I went through the industry area, nothing, the rest of the show floor, nothing. So I'm kind of surprised that they didn't have a booth. Um, another thing they had in the dealer's room was Otakon, for the past couple of years, has had the Otakon Museum in kind of a small room to, uh, off to the side. Of some of the main hallways this year they put it in the dealer's room so i've got a lot more people checking out i saw a lot more people walking by looking at the display cases of old badges and things like that but they added some neat new stuff they had you know kind of a collection of magazines from kind of the early days of the of the uh, anime boom so there were things like that one of the neater things that they had now that i actually asked kind of the staff member working about it was they had a sheet of uncut badges like you know just you get your normal real general attendee badge you write your name or whatever boom you're on your way this was the uncut sheet and i asked how they got it and they said the printing company that actually made this badge i think this was for the 2000 convention um i'm not sure off the top of my head but they said the printer actually contacted them and it was like clean out some old stuff or said hey do you guys want that and they said sure they framed it and put it in the museum and that was a really cool thing to see um, of course, the la I can't 
mention the Dojo Room without talking about the booth for the Dragon Ball North American Tour. This, guys, this was probably the best booth I have ever seen at a convention. Ever. It was so neat. First off, right above it, like, suspended from the ceiling, was a giant uh, figure of the sh the dragon Shenron, kind of the, the t titular dragon from the series, right above the booth, so you couldn't miss it. It was a uh, they had statues of some of the characters. They had a wall that had kind of the timeline. I'm talking about the different uh, story arcs that have been going on. They had figure displays. They had photo booths, so you could like take pictures to look, make it look like you were eating a giant meal, like the main character Goku, or riding on the uh, flying Nimbus, things like that. It, it looked like a little bit of the. Uh, Tenkaichi uh, Budokai uh, tournament stage, great place, lots of great places to get pictures of neat stuff. The center, like kind of the heart of the booth, was carpeted so you could spend a lot of time wandering on there and not get your feet sore. Guys, this was this booth was incredible, and I wish I could see more booths like this overall because it was really cool. And in, I guess double check see if the Dragon Ball North American tour is going anywhere near. A con that you're attending because this booth was incredible definitely really need to check out um so that was that um so some other things i noticed were otakon started using a lot of the digital signage that was part of the convention center like in the main hallway as you kind of enter the front door of the convention center near the main stairs there was a big sign for registration and a big sign for the photo suite so you couldn't miss it right there as he entered and big signage for that but they kind of the smaller just kind of tv screens scattered throughout if they weren't just general knowledge they had like some advertisements but it was like i felt like i saw the same two every time i walked by so i don't know if they need to ask their sponsors to give them more material to cycle through if they should internally work to kind of insert more content for people to see things like that just enough to keep it interesting because by the end it just seemed like that's all we ever saw in there so good use of it could be better um so i don't know um one other thing i'll mention was i talked about uh john and lauren from the gunpla 101 website they run the site gunpla 101 on this and uh, so they signed up for a panel they submitted one called gunpla 101 they run the website um and they mentioned in their uh description that they're the people that run the site gunpla 101. there was a panel called gunpla 101 and yeah the, it's not a copyright term because it's uh bandai who does it but it wasn't john and lauren's panel and a lot of people were confused a lot some people were kind of annoyed and even john and lauren were uh, kind of offended because i mean i don't want to put words in their mouth but they run the website with this name and their panel wasn't accepted even though there's calling and someone else using the same name as their the website that they work on was accepted so it seems a little, little strange um i think they did voice their concerns to the staff but again this is something in my opinion that shouldn't have happened that said i don't want to end on a down note otakon continues to be one of my favorite conventions i always have a blast at this convention it feels like more and more that Washington, D.C. is the convention center there is a good fit for it. I think they're finding more ways to use the space better. It only has, it can only get better from here. It's a lot of things going on. The guests were great. There was a lot of neat programming. I wish I had time to see more of it. It's, yeah, I was very happy with it. I felt I left this con feeling very positive about it overall and a lot of, People I spoke with, either friends or just general attendees, like listening to them as I was going to the hall, were saying that they had a really good time at this convention. So I think that's a good sign, and I hope things keep going up for Otakon. And I definitely want to go back. I'm not going to break my streak anytime soon, but it's not just because of that I've been going to this convention that the longest that I keep going. I do really have a good time every time I go, and this was no exception. So, if you have thoughts on Otakon, or any other convention for that matter, don't forget to get in touch with us. You can send us an email at podcast at animecons.tv. You can look up Animecons TV 
on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Tumblr. We're all over the place. Let us know what you think. And that's about it for me. I'm Doug Wilder, and we'll see you guys again soon.